All right, so here uh, we're going to be continuing to discuss properties of integrals, uh, sort of uh, dropping in a fourth, fifth, and sixth property. Uh, in fact, all of these uh, properties, four, five, and six, actually to, thinking back to the last video, to tandem up with properties two and three, uh, are all able to be expressed geometrically. And in fact, whenever we go through four, five, and six, we're going to be explaining these completely geometrically. And um, it's the natural language of integration, frankly, because integrals are an expression of the area under the curve. Uh, the only property that showed up that didn't relate to the geometry was whenever you happen to have the bounds in opposite order, in which case the integral value came out oppositely. But OK, so let's check this out. So uh, what do we've got here? Uh, we've got assume a function has values greater than or equal to 0 for all x between a and b. Let's think about what this means. Here's a, here's b. Our function has values greater than or equal to 0. That means our function, if anything, lives above the x-axis. Now maybe, I guess worst case scenario, the function is 0 all the way across. But if the function has a value greater than or equal to 0 everywhere between a and b, the function is certainly not below the axis. So maybe the function is up here like so. Maybe the function is down here like so. Maybe the function is coming in like so. But what we know for sure is that the function never dips below the x-axis. So think about this. What could be said Let's say this. In such a case, what could be said of the integral between a and b of f of x dx? What could be said of the area of those many rectangles that we draw when we sum them up? Well, because every rectangle lives above the x-axis, every rectangle has positive area measure, and the sum of all of those positive area measures would have to be something positive. Well, I guess worst case zero if the function was flatlined on the x-axis. That would be the extremal case here. But uh, at the very least, if the function lives above the x-axis, then the integral, the area as it is interpreted with respect to integral, a signed area technically, uh, that would have to be greater than or equal to zero as well. If the function values are positive, the integral value is positive. If the function lives above the x-axis, the signed area positive. Uh, what about this next guy? What if f of x is greater than or equal to g of x for all x? So f of x is in effect a taller function. So who knows where g of x is, but wherever g of x is, f of x is above. Now what can we say here? Think about the area between a and b related to the two functions. Because f has greater function values, f is going to have greater heights on all of its rectangles. In such a case, The integral from a to b of f of x has got to be greater than or equal the integral from a to b of g of x. Right? If the, if the rectangles built up to f of x are taller than the rectangles built up to g of x, then there's extra area under f of x possibly. I mean, I suppose based on how this is defined, assuming that f of x could possibly be equal to g of x. I mean, worst case scenario, the two functions are the same and their areas are the same. But it's possible that f of x is, if anything, taller, which means the rectangles would be, if anything, taller, which means the area under f would be, if anything, more. Uh, what about property six? This one might be a little bit trickier to think about, but once we look at it from the right point of view, uh, I guess the final statement looks maybe more mystifying from this problem, but it's really not saying a ton whenever you get down to the bottom of it. Let's assume 
that for all x between a and b, our function has values between little m and big M. That means if big M is somewhere along the y-axis and little m is somewhere else along the y-axis, our function lives somewhere in between. Our function never extends above m and never extends below little m. Okay, what could we say about the area under our function? Well, if our function is below capital M, then our function's area is less than a rectangle, M units tall. In other words, so let's put that bound down. In this case, the area has to be less than how much area would be covered by a rectangle, capital M units tall, that would be capital M times B minus A. Because a rectangle always has area of its height times its base, and its base would be B minus A, and its height would be capital M, and B minus A times capital M, well, would be an area bigger than our function F because capital M is bigger than our function F everywhere. Well, I guess it could be equal to in some cases, but uh, yeah, it, the worst, our function is equal to m everywhere, and then our area would be equal to the size of the rectangle. However, uh, generally speaking, it, when we're talking about our, our big m and our little m, our function could be, if anything, less than big m. So the area under our function would be less than an area built by a rectangle at a height of capital M. Now, what about the other side? Because I claim, since we know that our function is taller than little m everywhere, we know that our area under our curve is bigger than some value. Because our function is taller than little m, if we built a rectangle at little m, the area of that rectangle would have to be less than the area under our function. Because our function is taller than little m, so the area under a rectangle at little m would be smaller. So little m would build a rectangle of little m times b minus a uh, with times height. And well, looking at this here, uh, if you built a rectangle at little m, the area under that rectangle is going to be less than the area under our function. And if you build a rectangle at big m, that would be an area that would be more than the area under our function. And this is because big M was bigger than any function value, and little m was smaller than any function value. And uh, well, the long story short, I guess, on this video and this past two video sequence of videos is that now we have some properties of integrals to give us sort of an intuitive feeling about how integrals work. Uh, and the content of the three properties here in summary is this. Uh, if a function lives above the x-axis, then its area is going to be positive. If one function lives above another function, then, well, the rectangles that are controlling the area of the taller function are going to be bigger in area, and hence the area under the taller function is greater than or equal to the area of the smaller function. And if your function lives between two values, then your area under your function is going to be bigger than a rectangle built on the smaller value and smaller than a rectangle built on the larger value. And that's a wrap.